and to speak. So I'm not uh, really in the QEC community, but I'm told that every year there's at least one talk on dynamical decoupling or error mitigation at the physical layer, so that this, that's this talk. Uh, so yeah, so the idea is to use an idea called geometric space curves to facilitate this process of figuring out how you can cancel errors dynamically on quantum hardware. So if you're not familiar with a, what a space curve is, don't worry, I'll explain that. So this, uh, as I said, is about minimizing errors at the physical layer. So we have interactions with the environment that can cause noise and decoherence. We have uh, also control errors, crosstalk, all kinds of other effects that uh, lead to imperfect algorithms and operations. So a lot of this can be dealt with at the device level by using better materials, better architectures, and things like that to try to eliminate the noise at its source. Um, but suppressing the noise entirely at this uh, device level is not going to be enough to reach quantum error correction thresholds. And so to really get to that, uh, those levels that we need of uh, uh, gate fidelities and so on, we need to do something as in addition to this uh, device improvement type uh, strategy, which is to use controls which are smart, know something about the noise that's going on in the device, and design them in such a way that you can dynamically suppress these effects. So that's the, the, the point of this talk. So this is an old idea that dates back at least 70 years more, or more than that actually, going all the way back to Hans Spinecko and other similar techniques from nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, so the basic idea in Hans Spinecko, as most of you know, is you apply a pi pulse halfway through the evolution, and in the presence of, say, a slowly fluctuating magnetic field, if you think, think about this qubit as a spin, then you can basically remove all the, the effects of that uh, dephasing caused by these fluctuating magnetic fields uh, at the final time. So, and this idea of Hans Binecko has been used very successfully in uh, quantum computing devices for a long time now. It also can be generalized to not just a single pulse halfway through the evolution, but applying multiple pulses at, at certain time intervals. Uh, in uh, sequences like CPMG or other sequences which are very popularly used also in, in quantum computing. So these are some examples. These are three experiments of all of different types of spin qubits where these methods have been applied quite successfully to extend coherence times, in some cases from tens of nanoseconds up to about a millisecond. So these methods are quite effective, um, but they're very good at preserving quantum states, but what we actually want to do is to perform gate operations on our qubits, and so the question that we should ask next is, can we do similar things while we're trying to do gate operations? And this leads to this idea of dynamically corrected gates. And so, of course, a gate is something that uh, we create by evolving under some Hamiltonian. We look at the evolution operator. At some final time, we want that to be some particular matrix, like a, a not gate or something else. That's how we create our gates in the first place at the physical layer. And so here, you know, we have some generic single qubit Hamiltonian. Uh, I'll use this sort of form through a lot of the talk. So we have a driving field on one axis, the x-axis in this case, and some constant energy splitting delta or some detuning parameter. And so we want to try to choose this driving field omega of t, some electromagnetic field, in such a way that we realize some um, final form of this unitary. So how can we cancel noise uh, while we're trying to create some unitary like this? And so in reality, this is what the Hamiltonian looks like. There are noise fluctuations on this detuning parameter. There are noise fluctuations in the driving field itself. Um, we could have more complicated things as well. And so the question is, can we still realize the target gate that we want? And can we choose this driving field omega of t in such a way that we eliminate at least the first few orders of these noise terms, assuming that the noise is weak enough that we can make sense of a perturbation series expansion in, in these noise terms? And of course, there are many ways that we can realize a quantum gate. There are many possible control fields, many different ways to go from the initial identity matrix to some t final target gate, like a not gate. And so some of, these some of these ways of reaching the final gate are much more robust to, to noise in the system compared to others. And so how can we identify these optimal ways of realizing gates? So this is also an old problem that date b dates back to the 60s, also from the NMR. People have developed all kinds of control sequences to correct noise in quantum operations, spin rotations, for example. And I started working in this field about 10 years ago when it was noticed that some of these, uh, some of these techniques from NMR just don't apply to a lot of qubit platforms because there are all kinds of restrictions, physical cons constraints that come into play when you think about the physics of a given hardware. So for example, if you think about a type of qubit called the singlet triplet spin qubit, you can't make the control field negative and positive arbitrarily throughout the evolution. You can, but it's, it's really, really technologically challenging. And so there's this constraint that, you, that the field has to always be positive. And so a task that I worked on uh, 10 years ago was how do you construct things like people use in NMR, but given this, uh, this constraint. 
And we went and we developed uh, control sequences like this waveform you see here, where we just assumed square functions, waveforms, just because everything is mathematically simpler that way. And then the question is, how do you combine a bunch of square pulses to get the target gate that you want while canceling these types of noise effects that I showed in the previous slide? So square pulses are nice mathematically. Experimentally, they're not so nice. You can actually produce a, a waveform that turns on and off arbitrarily fast. And so you know, after working with experimental groups uh, with this sort of technique, we realized you know, this is not a, a nice way to proceed. And can we do something like this, but uh, relaxing this constraint of square waveforms or delta function pulses? Can we use more physical pulses, things that have smooth shapes, and accomplish the same sort of task? And the challenging thing about this problem now is that we can no longer have analytical control over the solutions to the Schrodinger equation if we move away from these ideal waveforms. So how do we deal with this problem? So what I'll, what I'll show you is there's a general solution to this problem. And to understand how it works, let's focus on the simplest possible case of dynamical decoupling. So here's, again, just a, a one qubit Hamiltonian. There's a control field on the x-axis, omega of t. There's some uh, detuning noise, epsilon. And so in the absence of the noise, I, I could say that this is a, a pulse that's on resonant with my qubit. But the presence of the environment leads to some fluctuation in that uh, energy splitting. So there's some detuning error as a, as a consequence, and that's this epsilon. And so my goal is to try to cancel the epsilon at least to the first few orders and realize the target operation. And in this case, it's going to be some x rotation. And so I can do a perturbation series expansion. And order by order, I can try to cancel these terms. And I need to cancel them at the final time. And so I have these constraints where the coefficients order by order should, should vanish at the final time, capital T. And I can write down, in this case, a nice uh, recursive formula for these coefficients as I go to higher and higher orders. If you want to derive spin echo, if you want to derive CPMG, these are the conditions you write down, and you solve them, assuming delta function pulses in that case. Or you can try to solve them using square pulses in the case of more uh, you know, fancier NMR techniques. So we can actually solve these in full generality without assuming pulse shapes of a particular form by doing the following. Take the first order coefficient. It's called G1. This is a complex function of time. I can plot it in a complex plane. So as time progresses, uh, initially I start at the origin at t equals 0. As time progresses, I trace out some path in this complex plane. And I call it the error curve because this is a measure of the first order error. It's the coefficient of that leading order term in epsilon. All right, so that's a trivial statement. But what's interesting is that if I stop at some time t and I compute the curvature of this curve I'm drawing, it's inversely related. Well, actually, the curvature is directly related to the pulse amplitude, omega. And the curvature is the inverse radius of the circle that has the same second order derivative as the curve at that point. So this is a non-trivial statement. And it's a powerful statement because my goal is to cancel the noise, which means that, that this error curve has to come back to the origin at the final time. And the question is, how do I choose omega such that that closure of the curve is achieved? And the answer is I could just draw a curve. Draw a closed curve and read off the curvature, and that tells you the pulse that accomplishes that noise-canceling gate operation. And moreover, if I want to know what is the gate time once I draw the curve, that also has a nice geometric interpretation, which is it's just the total arc length of the curve I draw. So as soon as I draw a curve, I know, one, it's guaranteed to cancel the first order noise, and two, the time it takes is just the length of the curve I drew. This is a general solution to the problem. So any pulse that cancels noise to leading order corresponds to a closed curve. And for this particular Hamiltonian, it's a curve in two dimensions. So I need to draw closed curves. So a nice way to get analytical expressions for closed curves is to go back to the 19th century mathematicians. They all had their favorite figure eight shapes called lemnus gates. Girono had this particular shape on the top there. Uh, Bernoulli had his other favorite shape on the bottom there. If you just chop the figure eight in half, you get a nice closed curve. And a third interesting fact that comes out of the math is that the opening angle at the origin tells you the angle of rotation about the x-axis that you're performing. So if you want to perform a pi over 2 gate about x while canceling the noise, draw a closed curve such that the opening angle at the origin is uh, related to pi over 2. And then to read off the pulse, uh, I just have to compute the curvature at every point. There's a simple formula for it. I didn't put it on the slide. But for this uh, Girono pulse, I have this nice uh, shape. Looks kind of like half of a sinusoid. And then for Bernoulli, I have this, uh, these other pulses that come out. And if I want different x rotations, I have to change the opening angle at the origin. 
So down here I'm showing four different closed curves with different opening angles. They realize four different X rotations of different angles. Uh, and you can see the pulses that do it on the right-hand side. So I said this is a general solution. I've made no assumptions, which means I should be able to go back to my NMR literature and understand all those delta function pulses, square pulses, whatever, in this geometric language. So this is what Spinecho looks like. So Spinecho says, do nothing for time t over 2, then apply a delta function pulse, then do nothing for another time t over 2. So no pulse in this geometric language means no curvature, which means a straight line. So you start at the origin, you draw a straight line. When you reach the point, the halfway point where you apply the delta function pulse, now you have infinite curvature at that one point, and so you turn around 180 degrees, and then the, the second half of the evolution, again, there's no pulse, so you just retrace the same line back to the origin. And so at exactly at time t, you cancel the noise. And so the pulse is just this delta function pulse halfway through the evolution. I can derive CPMG the same way. Instead of going up and down once, I go up and down any number of times I want. So long as I stop at the origin at the end, I cancel the noise. And so if I do that periodically, going up and down the same distance every time, that's CPMG. I can also derive infinitely many more pulse sequences just by changing when I turn around. So long as I stop at the origin at the end, I cancel the noise. But the general solution is to get off the line which is what you have if you focus on delta function pulse sequences and start drawing curves in, in two dimensions. What about higher orders? What if I want to cancel second order noise? So if you look at that second order coefficient in my earlier perturbation series expansion in epsilon and look at that coefficient, it turns out to be related to the area enclosed by the curve. So now if I draw closed curves that have zero net area, I cancel both first order and second order noise. So now I can go back to my, my uh, favorite lemnus gates and keep the entire lemnus gate. And because there's an orientation associated with these curves, like for example in these figure eights here, I go counterclockwise in the upper half plane, I go clockwise in the lower half plane, and so there's a relative sign between the two lobes of these figure eights. And that means that the areas will cancel. And so here I have eight, uh, four different figure eights. Uh, they all have zero area, so these are pulses uh, um, that cancel both the first and second order noise terms. Now, if the figure eight has too much symmetry, they only generate identity gates because the opening angle at the origin is always pi. That, that translates to an identity gate. Uh, if I want to have a non-trivial gate that cancels noise to second order, I need to draw something a little bit less symmetric. And so that's what's shown here. Here are four different curves that have zero net area, but they have different opening angles at the origin, meaning that they generate different X gates. And these are the corresponding pulses obtained from their curvatures. So this idea has been uh, another way to think about this. You know, I can think about an environment that causes noise fluctuations in my qubit energy splitting. Uh, I can also think about this as just being inhomogeneities in an, an ensemble of qubits, an array of qubits, and I'm trying to do global addressing of these qubits. And so this was an idea that was pursued by Andrew Zurek, where they took this geometric idea and started designing gates that, you know, for for ro for global fields uh, that could address the qubits despite the fact that they have slightly different frequencies, et cetera. All right, so the other fact I mentioned earlier is that as soon as I draw the curve, I know exactly how long it takes because that's the arc length. And so I can ask the question, what is the fastest pulse that cancels noise? And obviously the one thing I could do is just draw a closed curve and then I can just continuously shrink the curve. But if I do that, uh, okay, I'm decreasing the gate time, but I'm also increasing the curvature, which means I'm increasing the pulse amplitude. And so at the end, I'll just end up getting back a delta function, which I don't like. And so to make it physical, what I can do is impose a constraint on the curvature. I can ask, what is the shortest curve that's closed that implements a particular rotation? It has some particular angle subtended at the origin, and such that the, the curvature never exceeds some given amount, some given bound. And I could just set that bound to be one without loss of generality, since I'm a theorist. And so I can turn this into a variational calculus problem where I say, I want to minimize the length given this constraint on the curvature. You can write down the Lagrangian uh, using slack variables. It's pretty straightforward. And if you go and you, you, work, you work out the Lagrange, Euler-Lagrange equations, they turn out to be trivial. And you can show that the solutions are comprised of straight lines and circular arcs pieced together. And because this is a variational calculus problem, you get local solutions, you don't know what the global solution is. And so you have to figure out 
how can I piece these straight lines and circular arcs together in such a way that I get the shortest possible closed curve. Now, if you think about it, there are three possibilities that have only three segments. I can have two straight lines connected by a circular arc, or I can have one straight line and two circular arcs, or I can have three circular arcs. But given these possibilities, I can then ask, okay, which one is the shortest given some target X operation? And for all possible rotation angles about the x-axis, you can show that the third option is always the fastest. It's always the shortest curve. So the time-optimal pulse is a three-part square pulse, and this is the globally time-optimal solution. You cannot find a pulse that's faster than this that implements some uh, given x-rotation and canceling noise at the same time. So I started this by saying I don't like square pulses, I don't like delta function pulses. The global uh, optimum is a square pulse, that's a fact of life, it's a mathematical fact. I can then try to get as close as this, uh, to this as possible given some bandwidth constraints in my actual physical hardware. And so we've also done work showing that if you impose bandwidth constraints you can get very close to this time optimal um, gate speed um, uh, and while respecting those constraints. And you can keep playing this game to higher orders, so if I go to second order and again re I demand that I want to cancel the first two orders of noise with the shortest possible curve. Again, you can show that the, this optimal curve is now comprised of five circular arcs pieced together. And so the time optimal pulse is a five part square pulse. All right, so that's the, the simplest possible Hamiltonian, the simplest possible quantum dynamics problem you can work with. What if we want to generalize it a little bit by adding a non-zero detuning parameter, delta? So now delta is something I know, epsilon is some stochastic noise parameter coming from my environment or, or whatever. And now I still want to do the same thing. I want to try to design omega of t such that I cancel the, at least the first order in, in epsilon. And the first problem I run into is that I can no longer even solve this problem when epsilon is zero. So in the absence of noise, I cannot solve the Schrodinger equation for this two-level system. This is the simplest quantum dynamics problem, and there's no analytical solution for arbitrary omega of t. And so even at zeroth order, I don't know what the solution looks like. But it doesn't matter because the Schrodinger equation, this, this problem of trying to design gates, it's a one-way problem, right? If I say, here's my Hamiltonian, tell me what u is, that's a hard problem. But if you say, here is u, tell me what the Hamiltonian is, that's an easy problem. I just have to differentiate the evolution operator, I get the Hamiltonian. And when I'm designing curves, I'm really designing the evolution, and I'm reading off the Hamiltonian by computing the curvature. And so I'm really doing this reverse problem, and so the fact that I can't solve the zeroth order case doesn't matter. And so I can just formally write down in a perturbation series expansion for the evolution operator still. I don't know what u0 of t is, um, but it doesn't matter. I can still formally define the first order term in terms of some now collection of functions, which I call rx, ry, and rz. These are real functions of time. And I can treat them as the three coordinates of a curve in three dimensions. And if I want the noise to cancel, it should be hopefully clear from this expression that I still need this curve to come back to the origin at the final time. I still need a closed curve. So the consequence of having this non-zero detuning parameter is that now I'm drawing curves in three dimensions instead of two. And a curve in two dimensions has one function that characterizes it. That's this curvature function I've been talking about. A curve in three dimensions has not only the curvature, but also something called the torsion which is a measure of how much the curve is twisting at every point in space. And for these 3D curves, you can go and calculate the curvature and the torsion. The curvature is still this driving amplitude, and the torsion turns out to be the detuning. And so as soon as I draw a 3D curve, I can read off what is the curvature, what is the torsion, by computing these quantities using simple mathematical formulas, which I don't have on the slide. So this is the general solution for this slightly generalized single qubit Hamiltonian where I have a non-zero detuning. And so I still need to construct closed curves, so I can just go and construct closed curves in 3D. Um, if I just want to cancel the first order noise, I have to draw simply a closed curve like shown here. And here I'm reading off the, the pulses corresponding to this curve, and I'm showing the infidelity, which is improved as a consequence of making sure the curve is closed. Now if I want to cancel second order as well, that uh, closed area, that vanishing area constraint generalizes to the following. I have to draw a closed curve like this, such that when I look at three orthogonal shadows, each of those shadows has vanishing area. And so this is the generalization of this vanishing area condition we had previously. And again, this is totally general. 
if the pulse cancels noise in second order, it corresponds to such a curve, which is closed and has vanishing area shadows. Now, one additional complication that happens when you move from 2D to 3D is that now, if I'm thinking about a situation where I'm driving my qubit with some constant frequency and some constant detuning, that means I need to draw a closed curve with constant torsion. And the problem of trying to find closed curves of constant torsion is an open problem in the mathematical literature on differential geometry. And so we, that was a little bit of an obstacle, but we actually came up with a general recipe to construct such curves. I'm not gonna go through the details, but you can systematically construct curves by starting by with a closed curve in a 2D plane with certain symmetries, project it onto the surface of a sphere, and you're guaranteed that the torsion is constant. So this problem you can solve systematically. All right, so I've been talking about canceling noise and the detuning parameter, and I was using this epsilon previously, now I'm calling it delta z, unfortunately, for no good reason. Um, so what if I have also noise in the driving field itself, and I'll consider the case of multiplicative noise, meaning that the, my amplitude fluctuates kind of overall in time uh, as a consequence of interactions with the environment or as a consequence of just errors in my, my control hardware. Now I can work out, so this is work that was done by Hunter Nelson who is here, and he actually has a poster on it if you wanna find out more details. Um, so I can work out a condition such that I not only cancel this noise in the detuning parameter, but I also cancel noise in the driving field at the same time. And so again, starting with my definition of the space curve, I can focus on now the derivative of the, of the space curve, r dot, this is called the tangent curve. And so this first condition here is again just saying that the, the space curve is closed. If I integrate its tangent, that vanishes. That means the space curve is closed. So that's still the condition I need to cancel the detuning noise. But now there's an additional constraint that we derived, which is the area, the projected areas of this tangent curve have to vanish. So it's a bit like this second order condition, uh, the second order noise cancellation condition for detuning noise I talked about previously. But now this is a condition on the tangent curve, the derivative of the space curve. And so long as its projected areas vanish, I'm canceling control field errors. And this is again is a general constraint. Any pulse that satisfies this condition of canceling both types of noise at the same time has to correspond to a space curve that satisfies both of these constraints, these geometric constraints. And again, I can, once I construct such a curve that solves, that satisfies these constraints, I can compute the curvature to get the amplitude, I can compute the torsion to get the detuning field or the, the phase field phi. And uh, Hunter and uh, Vagelis Pelioras, another student in our group, worked out three different methods for solving these constraints systematically. So sort of three different families of solutions. And uh, I won't go through the details here, but if you want to find out more, uh, see Hunter's poster. Um, so given these constraints, you know, what sort of things can you do? So you can ask, okay, if I start constructing curves that satisfy only the one or the other constraint, do I see that in the reflected in when I compute gate fidelities? And so here, for example, is a curve that satisfies uh, the one constraint, it's canceling to tuning noise, so it's uh, uh, you know, better along this axis, but it's uh, not dealing with the amplitude noise. And then if I insist that now the curve be uh, uh, such that it cancels the amplitude noise, it satisfies this vanishing area condition, but it's not closed, then now I see that reflected in the fidelity here because now it's not robust to detuning noise, but it is robust to this amplitude noise. And then I can do the other cases as well, um, and so, uh, but I see that if I cancel, if I satisfy both constraints at the same time, I see that reflected here and, and that there's robustness to both types of noise, uh, as you can see. So yeah, so see the poster by Hunter this afternoon if you'd like to hear more details about how you construct these solutions. So this approach is quite general. I've been talking about a single qubit just to try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, but for any at least finite dimensional Hilbert space, you can translate the quantum dynamics into a space curve in some number of dimensions that depends on the Lie algebra of your Hamiltonian uh, and drive field. And a space curve in D dimensions has D minus one generalized curvatures. So in three dimensions, we saw there was this thing we called the curvature plus the torsion. As you go to higher dimensions, you have D minus one such generalized curvatures. And uh, a couple of years ago, we worked out a general formula that relates the terms in the Hamiltonian to these generalized curvatures. So once you draw a closed curve, for example, if you're trying to cancel some sort of noise term in your Hamiltonian, 
you can systematically work back and figure out what are the control fields that realize that evolution. And so we applied this uh, formula to study two cubic gates or to look at single cubic gates in the presence of an always-on interaction. So you can have, for example, a Hamiltonian like this, where you're trying to do a gate on qubit 2, an X gate, and you have this icing interaction between, between that qubit and another qubit. And the Hamiltonian you can write out like this. It has this uh, nice uh, block structure. If you go and compute the curvatures and the Lie algebra for this Hamiltonian, you discover that this corresponds to a curve in six dimensions. And if you want to cancel, uh, in this case, dephasing noise on qubit 2 while doing this single qubit X rotation, and in the presence of this uh, interaction with the other qubit, then you need to draw a closed curve in six dimensions. Uh, but this uh, particular problem has a nice feature that we have this block diagonal structure to the Hamiltonian, which means we can actually factorize the 6D curve into two 3D curves, each of which has to be closed. And these two 3D curves are related in terms of their curvatures. They have to be the same. But you can still systematically construct such curves, and we've done that in various examples, not just this case of a single qubit gate, but also for a two qubit C naught gate, for example. And so one approach you can take is to make closed curves by gluing together helices. Uh, and so you could do that using perfect helices, in which case you end up with a square waveform like this. But you can also smooth in your helices a little bit to get something which is a little bit more physically feasible, nice smooth pulses like this. And so these, this particular pulse here will do an X rotation on qubit 2 while canceling dephasing noise and essentially decoupling it from qubit 1 at the same time. So we've uh, taken this uh, idea in a number of different directions, and I don't have time to talk about all of them. Uh, one thing that we've done is to connect it to holonomic evolution, which is this kind of old idea dating back to the year 2000 or so, where if you design all your gates to be essentially geometric phases, then you can hopefully get some sort of robustness from that. There's a lot of controversy about that. You don't, it's, not quite, uh, it's not quite how it works. But you can, for example, design, you can actually fix some of the issues with holonomic gates by designing curves which are both holonomic, give you holonomic evolution, but also will cancel things that the holonomic evolution misses, like transverse noise uh, effects. You can, so, so far I've been talking about quasi-static noise, meaning that this epsilon parameter, for example, is a constant during the gate. Uh, in reality, these noise fluctuations in the Hamiltonian will vary over time. And to a good approximation, the noise in transmon qubits, the noise in spin qubits, and so on, is quasi-static. The, the fluctuations are quite slow. But the fact that it's not really quasi-static, that it's something more like 1 over f type, uh, a 1 over f type spectrum, does matter in the end. And so you, have to, you also have to treat that frequency tail. And you can do that using this geometric formalism by generalizing it to not just having a single closed curve, but a family of closed curves. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. You can also make uh, the, the landau zener type physics more robust if you have some avoided crossing in your energy spectrum and that it fluctuates uh, as a consequence of environmental noise. And your task is to sweep through that avoided crossing or use the avoided crossing to do a gate, as is often done, for example, in superconducting qubits. Um, you can do so in a robust way by just designing curves with certain properties. And then we've also turned the problem around a bit. Instead of trying to cancel noise, you can also try to to achieve other things. For example, you can ask, what is the fastest possible entangling gate I can do in my hardware, you know, given constraints on the waveforms and other things? And you can actually make this curve not tell you something about the noise that's accumulated as a consequence of um, the errors that are accumulated as a consequence of environmental noise, but instead that you, can add, you can make the curve measure the amount of entanglement that's being uh, generated during the evolution. And so you can ask, you can use that idea to figure out the fastest possible entangling gates. So we have some work on that as well. And if you want to find out more overall about all this stuff, there's this review article that we wrote last year. And as I mentioned, one outstanding challenge is, OK, you can always map quantum dynamics to space curves in some number of dimensions. Uh, the real question is, when I draw a space curve in some number of dimensions, does it correspond to the Hamiltonian of my given problem? And the issue there is that you have to make sure that you know, in, in most physical platforms, the Hamiltonian is quite sparse. Only a few terms appear there, and that means that most of these generalized curvatures are zero or they're held constant. And so how do you systematically construct curves in higher dimensions that respect these constraints on the curvatures? 
So like this constant torsion problem I showed you earlier, which we've solved, how do you solve it more generally in higher dimensions? That's an, an ongoing work. The fact that mathematicians haven't solved the problem doesn't, doesn't discourage us. All right, so let me say a bit more about this time-dependent noise problem. So in reality, that epsilon or that uh, delta z um, depends on time. And I can take that into account by designing sequences of curves, which are all related to each other through differentiation. And so I can construct closed curves, a series of closed curves, and if I do that such that all the, the curves are closed in this sequence, then the final curve in the sequence will translate to a pulse, again through its curvature, which will cancel order by order the, the noise power spectrum as a, in powers of frequency. And so if I want to look at my filter function, for example, and I want to suppress things, you know, I, the quasi-static noise case corresponds to zero frequency, I want that to cancel, and then I can look at uh, the first order corrections to that in frequency, the, the next curve in my sequence, if it's closed, will cancel that. I can go to omega squared. The third curve in my sequence, if it's closed, will cancel that. I can keep building up, and I can flatten out my filter function effectively to screen out that tail and the noise power spectrum. And so if you want to read more about that, this is this work by Beacon Lee from, from 2021. So there are other types of games that we are playing uh, with this idea. So Hunter also has been working on uh, suppressing finite Rydberg blockade errors. So we heard quite a bit about Rydberg in the talk, the first talk this morning and also yesterday. Uh, we can use Rydberg excitations to do two qubit entangling gates in these uh, neutral atom systems trapped by tweezer arrays. And the idea here is that um, there's a strong Coulomb interaction between uh, electrons when they're in these highly, uh, these high principal quantum number states. And ideally, that interaction is incredibly strong compared to the other energy scales in the problem. And so I use the, the fact that, that that state in which both atoms are excited to the Rydberg level is uh, really high energy. And so I can effectively just accumulate a phase in a two-dimensional subspace, ignoring that state from my, from my evolution. But uh, in reality, that infinite energy splitting is actually not infinite, it's finite. And so that can lead to leakage errors or phase errors as a consequence of this additional level that hopefully uh, doesn't matter too much. And so what Hunter did was he worked out the constraints on the curves such that you cancel not only the type of noise I was talking about, detuning noise, driving field noise, but also uh, errors that come from the fact that this, this blockade energy is not infinite, but um, large, but it's still finite. And so these are the constraints on the curves that Hunter derived. And interestingly enough, if you focus on the case of time optimal pulses, then these constraints don't actually add any more constraints on your curves. So if you're trying to cancel detuning noise and control field noise, these come for free if you're working with time optimal pulses. And so you can cancel all of these effects at the same time. And so here's a, just a, one example of a, of a type of pulse that Hunter derived that satisfies all of these constraints. Uh, and if you'd like to hear more, please talk to him again at his poster this evening. So another way that we've been using this formalism is not as a way to generate new pulses that cancel noise, but also as a diagnostic tool. So we worked, for example, with Andrew Zurak a few years back where they had de designed single qubit gates using grape, single qubit uh, waveforms. And they considered uh, identity gates, uh, X gates, Z gates, and so on, Hadamard. And they were seeing pretty good performance from these gates, but things were not as working as well as, uh, as might have been expected in some cases. And so what we did was we mapped these pulses into space curves, and then we can analyze to what extent are they satisfying these constraints? To what extent are the curves closed? To what extent are the curves uh, exhibiting zero area? And so for each of these cases, you can see the space curve turns out to be closed, which is good. That means the bulk of the noise is being canceled. And you can see that the fact that we're getting these quasi figure eight shapes is indicating that we're also canceling second order noise. But if you look at the shadows of these, in some cases you see that it's not perfectly canceled. So here this shadow, for example, does not have zero area. So you can actually use this as a di diagnostic tool to figure out, okay, which quadrants of the second order noise are not being fully canceled and how can I correct my pulse shape to get rid of that residual error? So this is a, another uh, line of thinking that we've been pursuing. Okay, and then maybe just a couple of remarks about why all of this works. So 
There's a, a set of equations from differential geometry called Frenet's Surrey. They basically describe the shape of space curves. And uh, essentially what we're seeing is that the Schrodinger equation is just the Frenet's Surrey equation. So, you know, here again is our two qubit Hamiltonian. Like this could be any number of levels, doesn't matter. I can define a space curve as I've been talking about. And now I can de define a what's called a Frenet's Surrey frame, which is that at every point in time, I define three vectors. There's the tangent vector, which is parallel to the curve at that point. There's the normal vector, which is in the direction of the derivative of the tangent. And then there's the binormal, which is just orthogonal to those first two. So as time progresses, as I move along the space curve, I have this, these three axes, which can rotate and, and do various things. And then I can write down a set of equations for these three vectors as they evolve in time. And they're, because these are um, vectors of unit norm, you can show that the equations of motion have to have this form where you basically have two functions, kappa and tau. These are the curvature and the torsion. And for any choice of kappa, and for some given choice of kappa and tau, you can solve these equations to construct your space curve in terms of this uh, frenet array frame. And if you stare at this uh, equation long enough, you can recognize it as being basically like a spin vector equation. You know, writing down the Schrodinger equation, not for the two by, by the two component spin vector, but instead for the three component spin vector, the two component spinner, but for the three component spin vector. And so for more general uh, situations, multiple qubits, multi-level systems, you can talk about curves in higher dimensions. You can write down the Frenet's array equations. They contain d minus one curvatures now. But again, you can write down the Schrodinger equation in the right frame, in the right representation, and it's just the Frenet's array equation. So these two equations have been around for a long time. They're basically telling us the same thing. But it's a, you know, in summary, it's a, it's a nice way to give you a global perspective on what's going on uh, when you're trying to cancel noise. So the bottom line is that robust gates are in one-to-one -one correspondence with closed curves. If you want to have additional features, cancel higher order noise, cancel other types of noise, those curves have to satisfy some additional constraints. And the, the fun thing is that these constraints so far have been very geometrical in the sense that you can imagine that some, given some random constraint, some random type of noise I'm trying to cancel, when I translate it to space curves, it could be some horrendous integral constraint that I have to satisfy that I don't have any intuition for. But so far we've been seeing that the basic types of noise that we have in the actual devices translate to rather simple geometric constraints that are easy, easy to visualize. And this is nice because you know, we can use this to get a sense of what is the fastest possible gate that deals with all of these uh, errors and other considerations. Um, and we can use this to get a global perspective. We can see what is the time optimal solution here. And then if there are additional effects on top of that that we want to take into account, we can then you know, do numerics on top of that, feed this uh, initial analytical uh, result from space curves into some solver like GRAPE to get a more refined uh, waveform for a more complicated situation. So this method works for any number of levels, any number of qubits, and um, its basic origin is this nice connection between the Schrodinger equation and the Frenet's array equation. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ed. Thank you also for yeah, and also let me just mention that uh, I forgot this, this last final slide, which is important. Sophia gets really mad if I don't say this. Uh, so I'm part of a new center at Virginia Tech that we call VTQ for short. Um, we've been doing a lot of hiring the last few years. Some of these spaces I think are familiar to you. A lot of people from error correction, for example, have been hired recently. And we expect to hire another five or six going forward in the next couple of years. So I think we're on track to be one of the largest quantum theory groups around. So yeah, just wanted to say that. And we always have postdoc positions open. So if you're interested in anything that we do, please contact us. Sorry. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> we have a question way there at the back and then one over here. Let's see if the microphones can reach way back there. Sorry for sitting at the back. This is where all the electricity is. Uh, well, OK, so in, in most rooms, you can get away with saying that quantum systems evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. But here, many of us would be in different lines of work uh, if that were the case. Uh, so how much is known about time optimal control or fidelity optimal control 
when the when the dynamics are given by like a Lindblatian master equation. So from the point of view of space curves, this is an area that we're starting to look into now, but we don't have any results to share just yet. Um, there are results on you know quantum speed limits for open quantum systems. Uh, in terms of their practical utility, at least from my perspective, they've they're not so useful because the constraints tend to be rather uh, vague and and hard to to it's hard to input realistic parameters and such into them. Um, but I think it's an interesting direction to pursue. Question there. Yep. Hey, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I am not interested in with these two qubit gates or fancy gates, but the identity one. Uh, what is the fidelity or success of this method for identity gate? Because most of the time we need to do nothing half of the circuit. And this is actually called as identity gate, but we don't have any identity gate pulse. So we do nothing and it is fucking bad. So is this method can be useful for identity gate and how much? And how can I use this method for identity gate? Yeah, so the short answer is is yes, because any identity gate that cancels noise corresponds to a closed space curve of some sort. Uh, so one thing I could add to that is, you know, how good a fidelity you get depends on your, your control constraints. So there's going to presumably be some amplitude constraint that we have to take into account, a bandwidth constraint, and so on. So given those constraints, I can systematically figure out what is the, you know, what are the options for doing identity gates up to and that can cancel up to what order of the noise. Um, I do have a theorem that says that if you want to cancel all orders of the noise, then that requires delta functions. There's no way around it. And so we've also shown that as you go to higher and higher noise cancellation, your pulses are going to look sharper and sharper. And so that's consistent with this general theorem. And so the, the short answer is you have to tell me, you know, what are your constraints on the control? And then, then I can tell you how good you can do. Any more questions? One over here at the front. So oh, thank you for the great talk. So I was wondering if I have a two qubit gate and I can characterize all the fluctuations in this four by four Hamiltonian. So, um, so how, how to uh, design these uh, sequences given that, let's say we can only do two or three types of entangling gates. So, I, so if I kind of imagine this, uh, error curves, uh, worst case scenario, we have like 15 dimensions, right? So yeah, what is the, uh, yeah. so is it uh, easy to see what's the minimal set of entangling gates with which I can correct uh, a given two qubit error? So it depends on what the control fields, how they enter into the Hamiltonian and what other terms you have in the Hamiltonian. So it's 15 dimensions in the worst case where you're, you're generating the entire Lie algebra. Um, but I showed one example of a two-qubit gate where actually I only have curves in six dimensions to deal with. And on top of that, it factorized into two three-dimensional curves. So 15 dimensions is the worst case, but it's not necessarily what you have to deal with in your given problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. We have time for one more question, if there's any more. Okay. Yeah, one there. Thanks for the very interesting talk. So I, I understand that you mentioned Rydberg in the uh, end part, but uh, about two, two qubit gates, uh, usually you know we need like auxiliary levels instead of having a pure like two spin interaction. So would you comment on how that method will be applied to actual two qubit gates on hardware? Oh, so this example of Rydberg is a case where the two qubit gate is facilitated by having this auxiliary level involving the Rydberg. Right, and there the, you know, essentially, you know, if you focus on the, the relevant subspace, which is spanned by the one one state, and, the, and then the, the one e plus e one, uh, or sorry, the one r plus r one, and also the r r state. So this is the three level subspace of this Rydberg problem. But is this related to the previous uh, two qubit gate? Right. Yeah. So here, here are, you know, I'm, I'm trying to eliminate the coupling to the r r state, and so I'm left with really a two level subspace, the one one and the 1R plus R1. So that's a two-level system, and that's exactly the sort of structure I'm using to design these space curves. So that, that translates to some 3D curve. Ah, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, let's thank uh, Ed Barnes again.